everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, first uh, uh, um, session on machine learning. Um, okay, we have uh, three presentations in this uh, in this uh, session. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, given by uh, Manuel Mateos. The second one by Inentif, and uh, the third one by uh, Yixiang Lim. Uh, and uh, we start with the first presentation from uh, Manuel uh, Mateos. So Manuel, uh, he, he, he's with uh, Nomon uh, from February 2019 and uh, designs and implements uh, machine learning algorithms for air tra aircraft uh, trajectory prediction and air traffic modeling and forecasting. Uh, he's uh, pursuing his uh, PhD thesis on machine learning techniques for seamless traffic demand prediction at the Technical University of Catalonia, founded by Cesar A.G.H. KTM. And he's also involved in, uh, in some uh, sensor uh, year four uh, projects such as uh, AI chain. Uh, so, uh, Manuel, the floor is yours. Uh, the, uh, Paper is on un unveiling airline preferences for pre tactical route forecast through machine learning and innovative system for ATFCM pre tactical planning support. Thank you, George. Uh, hello to everybody. Um, today I'm, I'm going to, to tell you a little bit about this, uh, this joint research between Oman and DPC related with my, with my PhD thesis, with the, which is uh, unveiling airline preference for pre-tactical route and forecasting through, through machine learning. Um, first of all, I, I want to uh, present you the, uh, uh, give, a, give you a, a quick introduction to the, uh, to the research. Then uh, I will uh, go further on details on the, on the route probability model that we have developed. And um, then I will present some, some results and then I will close with the conclusions and uh, next steps. About the, the reasons that um, are mo that motivated this, uh, this job is that uh, nowadays the network manager needs to, to fly the, needs the flight plans uh, from the airlines uh, prior to the day of operations uh, in order to detect the demand and capacity imbalances. The problem is that uh, most of the time these uh, flight plans uh, do not uh, uh, come uh, in time. I mean, uh, usually airlines uh, file these flight plans with uh, with a few hours uh, only. So uh, the network manager need, needs to uh, predict these uh, flight plans uh, for which they use the, uh, the predict solutions that basically um, takes the, uh, the flight plan from the previous week, which some uh, with some uh, additional restrictions, then uh, we will uh, see more details about it later. Um, if we uh, were able to to get some uh, uh, some better approach, because this is clearly not uh, not, not the optimal approach uh, with the data available, if if we can uh, get a better uh, a better uh, demand forecast, um, we will get to a point where um, uh, we don't need to uh, to to use some uh, so much regulations on the uh, on the system so uh, potential benefits are are high uh, the challenge with with this is that um, the traditional models uh, typically f physical models that are used uh, for trajectory predictions um, in order to uh, in, in order to be accurate, they need uh, sensitive information from uh, from the airlines that they are not willing to share. For example, the takeoff weight, the cost index, etc. Uh, so the opportunity here is very clear: Use, using historical historic data uh, and machine learning, it's possible to to predict the the route in the in this pre-tactical phase, and in this way, uh, we can we can um, get a better a better prediction. In order to do so, what uh, what we have done is take uh, this uh, uh, the historic of the of these routes. Uh, we have uh, uh, used uh, some properties from the flight. We have uh, weather data and some other vari variables that we will see later. 
we have trained our machine learning models and these machine learning models is, uh, is able to train the roots. Uh, this, uh, this model we have called a uh, root probability model. Uh, which is the, what's the approach of this uh, root probability model? Uh, this root probability model is intended to uh, replicate uh, the same uh, process that uh, go uh, that the airline follows to to make the flight planning. So um, conceptually, this means that we are generating one different model per airline. This um, this model predicts uh, the probability to choose uh, each one of the available routes for each OD pair independently. Um, so that means that um, uh, the observation of a, of a particular route is, a, is, of course, a valid observation. But uh, when, we, uh, when we observe in the, in the historic that uh, a particular airline is not uh, using a, a route, uh, this is also a very valid airline and that has a lot of inf information for the, for the model. So the features that we use uh, are, is, are expected to explain why this air is the, uh, the airline selecting these, uh, these routes and, and not the other routes. So uh, a route, uh, a, a route relative features are, uh, has, to, has to be independent. So if they have to be relative to to other routes uh, for a given OD pair and a, and a given air, airlines. And um, one good thing about this, uh, this approach is that it allows to, to include uh, routes that have never been observed in the past uh, just by computing these, these associated features uh, to these routes. Uh, here we can see that uh, uh, what this is, is intended to do in the, in the model. Um, for example, for this uh, particular flight, we have these two options available. We, uh, we run the, uh, the model, we get a different probability for each one of the routes, and then we select the route with the maximum probability, of course. Uh, the process follow to, um, to implement this, this model is, uh, first of all, we perform a route clustering, then we assign some features to each route, then we train the machine learning model and we validate the model. First of all, uh, the clustering. Um, the reason that we uh, that we are applying a, a clustering to the root is that the roots are, are um, complex objects. They are composed by hundreds of points. So changing a point in principle results in a different root. But uh, a small difference does not, does not affect the, the traffic demand. So we are not in, interested on in separating uh, very similar routes. So clustering helps to simplify the problem. Um, uh, typically, uh, clustering uh, has uh, three different key elements. One, the first one is, is the, the input data, which in this, this case is clear, the routes. Uh, the second one is the distance metric that uh, in, uh, this is a, a little bit more complicated because for, for simple points uh, it's more clear. But here for the um, for the routes to measure the the distance between between one route and not and another, we have uh, used uh, the area comprehended in between both of them. And um, if, uh, last uh, of these elements is the the aggregation algorithm, which is the, the DB scan, is a, a density-based uh, clustering, which indeed is um, pretty adequate for this kind of problems that, as we can see here on the, on the right, uh, roots are uh, roots are belonging to the same cluster are pretty, pretty close. So how, once we have um, um, once we have um, created these clusters, how, how we uh, assign the, the features to, to, this, to these routes. Uh, so um, the problem in here is that, uh, for example, uh, a length of 1,000 kilometers, um, it's, not, it's not the same in, in a different OD pair. So uh, we, have to, uh, we have to use, use um, re, uh, 
differences. We have to use uh, relative uh, relative features. So uh, in order to to get relative features, we have to uh, we have to we have to set a, a reference root in in each one of the cases. For example, in here we we can see some some very simple examples when we have uh, two different OD pairs with two different roots uh, uh, roots for each one. So uh, for for each one of the of the flights, uh, we have uh, we have a, a route that we have uh, selected, and the other one was not selected. But uh, this generates uh, two different observations, as we can as we can see in the in the table below. And we are using in this case the the first route as a reference, and we are just calculating the the difference uh, both for for length and and root charges. Uh, this way, we can use um, all the uh, all the data we have for for an airline um, in in the same da data set without differentiating in between between OD pairs. So, uh, what kind of uh, features are we using? Uh, we are using uh, root features, but also um, uh, some general features uh, about root features that are the ones that need to uh, that that uh, are, are need to be differentiated in order to um, to calculate this uh, this reference are the the root length which is taken in in kilometers uh, and from the root length we have calculated also the 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 length taking into account the the wind and with this uh, with this wind length we have approximated uh, the the fuel cost uh, taking into account the they cons uh, consume full fuel and uh, and the cost of this the, of the fuel. We have uh, also uh, calculated the, the root charges for each one of the routes, and then we have uh, some all together in this direct cost uh, variable. Also, we have uh, considered different uh, different variables for the uh, for the storm for the probability of a storm, and uh, and also the um, the local wind and original de uh, and destinations. Um, and the, the military zone, uh, we have uh, taken it into account, but uh, we are not using it as a, as a feature per se. We are just using to uh, uh, to remove those uh, those routes that are um, uh, encountering an, an active military zone because they are not able to be used. About general features are uh, are the the day of week, the, the time of flight, the day of the year, OD pairs, uh, some uh, uh, some uh, properties of the of the aircraft, as, such as the maximum take of weight, and also some characteristics about the the region destination pair, which are the airport population, airport GDP, and 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 the competence in the in the OD pair. In order to benchmark this. Uh, these results we we have created an in-house um, uh, implementation of the predict tool, which uh, basically uh, look for the flights with the same uh, call sign from on the same day of the week. And if it's possible, if it's not possible, it looks for um, for a, for a flight from the company which is close in, in time uh, to the one that we want to to predict. And if if not, uh, if this is not possible, just take uh, um, uh, the closest flight in the in the same OD pair. Also, we have uh, compared with the uh, with enhanced model. The enhanced model is the predecessor of this probability model, which is based of uh, which is based on a machine learning uh, multi-class classification uh, model by OD pair. Uh, this model is trained with uh, a fixed number of class classes, um, which does not allow new routes and um, the output uh, predictions can be only one of the routes, not the not the probability not the probability of flight to each one or each one of them. So it's um, uh, it's quite limited. So um, it, this model has some limitation, which uh, that have motivated the, the development of this new uh, root probability model. So uh, we have uh, made some some tests. Uh, with this uh, root probability model, we uh, we have take, uh, 
take the data from the airline uh, K KLM, um, assuming that uh, they have an uniform decision-making process. Um, taking uh, KLM, it's uh, like three percent of the of the flights in the in the CAC. Uh, the principal European uh, European airports are covered, so uh, we have a decent amount of data. Um, over half million observation in the in the data set considered, which takes uh, most uh, mostly the the year two thousand eighteen. Um, we have this discard this uh, part these pairs over five uh, five thousand kilometers because they involve some some information we don't have and because they are out of the out of the ECAC. And the machine learning algorithm is a, is a decision tree. Uh, this decision tree uh, provides the probability uh, of uh, flying each one of the available routes, and then we select the, the most the most probable probable uh, probable route. Uh, we consider that we have uh, uh, predict correctly the uh, a flight when this uh, predicted route ma match with the observed one, and we have tried also different uh, strategies. Um, uh, for the training, uh, we have and we have seen, as you can see in the um, in the table at the right, that the um, um, the best results are are obtained uh, for the uh, for the training uh, when the training is uh, is using data from the same season, which uh, uh, as we are using uh, validation IRAC uh, month of December mostly. So uh, when we use the winter season for training, it's much better for the much better for the model. And as we can see, this uh, this model is, a, is able to uh, beat, predict, and all previous model uh, by a large margin. Eighty-six percent of accuracy uh, against eighty-one point five percent. And uh, we have also checked that the. Um, uh, that the model is able to to predict non-observed routes. We have taken a, a particular example where uh, a new route uh, appeared, uh, which is this this Audi pair between uh, a Christian Sand uh, in Norway and Amsterdam. We we see in here that the route three in purple uh, uh, appears newly in the Iraq uh, 1813. Uh, so this route appears twice in the in the Iraq. Our model is able to predict it both times, and uh, of course, uh, the enhanced model and the and the predict are not are not able to do it. Uh, the re the results for each one of the of the cases in uh, of the um, root cluster which are uh, predict correctly and not are, are detailed in the in the table below. So uh, I will try to to summarize because I'm in the limit of my, of my time. Uh, we have uh, we have tested that this probability model uh, uh, for the airline K KLM, which covers three percent of the flights in the CAC, uh, gets a, a pro uh, gets a accuracy of eighty six percent. This means that it outperforms predict by uh, more than five percent, but which uh, but it's uh, which is also more more important. Uh, the number of uh, wrong predicts predictions um, committed by predict is reduced uh, in a 24.3 percent because I mean I mean uh, accuracy indeed is it's pretty high but the important thing is to reduce these uh, these cases in which uh, currently is not being done properly and we have all uh, we have uh, see also that uh, a pre that it's a, a, this model is able to to predict non observed routes and also that the that the training should be uh, should use data from the from the same season. Um, what are we doing to do next? Uh, we want to extend the evaluation of this proposed methodology to the main airlines operating in the ACAC area. We would like to explore other segmentation, for example, some OD per cluster in airline clustering, etc. And we want to uh, train um, more sophisticated machine learning models because by now we are using a a uh, decision tree, which is uh, quite good for uh, um, for interpretability, but uh, we think we can get more. 
we, we can get more accuracy from it. And last, uh, I would like to, to thank the Engage K KPM, uh, which is fund my, my PhD and also the support, uh, um, uh, the support from Eurocontrol, which they, they, ha they have helped a lot with this, with the, with this re research, uh, particularly I want to thank Ramon, Ramon Stella, Stefan, uh, Eric and, and Francis. They have, they, they have helped a lot with, the, uh, with the advice and, and support to the, to the research. So thank you very much. Uh, if you have any question, uh, I'll be happy to, to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. Thank you very much for keeping the time also. Um, I don't see any questions in the, on the Q&A. Um, okay. Uh, okay, uh, now I see the questions. <laughs> so so uh, um, one question is uh, as follows. Uh, you assume uh, route flown is the one uh, filled in the flight plan. However, other traffic flow control, including ground delay programs and uh, weather, for example, may result if the actual trajectory being different from the intended one flight plan. How do you address this issue? Uh, I mean, we are not, uh, we're not using the, the flown route. We are using the, um, the initial uh, flight plan from the DDR. Uh, it's right that the, this, uh, this in initial flight plan is not the first file flight plan, uh, which, um, which will be the, the optimal uh, data input to, to use, but uh, it's, a, it's a flight plan, not a, not a flown route. So it, uh, it might have some, uh, some influence uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from regulations, basically from the delay program, um, but um, we have we have to 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 deal with it because it's not uh, it has not been possible to to extract a first file flight plan uh, to um, to perform this this research. Okay. So uh, uh, Wix uh, uh, asks, uh, asks uh, whether the predicted route includes a seed and start uh, because this may depend on the airport runway configuration. So. Okay, so yeah, uh, we have observed that the, the indeed the the route selection depends on the on the uh, airport configuration. Uh, we we have seen it in the past, and as we don't don't have this information, uh, we ha we have found a, a proxy uh, which are the um, the the wind in the um, in the origin and destination airports. Uh, we are uh, we are extracting this data from the from the metar and we are using this uh, the basically uh, uh, ro uh, the the wind direction as a proxy of the uh, of the of the runway configuration at, at the airports which indeed we have observed that uh, it influence in the um, it has influence on the route selection it uh, i mean i have very limited Time today, but this is indeed very well explained on the uh, on the paper. So I encourage uh, you to to take a look. Okay. Uh, another question is from Sir, uh, who asks whether military is also uh, all, uh, whether they are always closed to operate, even for coordinated. Okay, so about the military zone, uh, we are only considering uh, CDR one and two because we are we are focusing on on flight plans. So uh, uh, military zone, uh, um, which use uh, this uh, CDR three, uh, cannot be cannot be used never in the in the flight plan. And uh, yeah, we uh, that's uh, that's what we uh, that's we are using. So you do not consider any kind of ATF uh, ATFCM regulations uh, as features in the model, right? For route availability. Uh, no, we are we are not considering any ATFCM um, um, regulations because I mean we are we are supposed to uh, I mean we are in a in a scope uh, prior to the. Um, and to the to the regulation applications. So um, I mean, in the pre-tactical phase, uh, 
it's uh, we we do not have this this information. We have tried to uh, to find some some correlations uh, between the the root selection and these uh, and these regulations, and we we can tell that uh, for now we we cannot uh, we have not found these these regulations. It's a uh, um, I, I mean it's a uh, it's it's difficult to to deal with the, this issue because as sometimes um, uh, re, um, these uh, short short terms ATFM measures are uh, motivating a change on the on the route on the route. So finally, you don't have the um, the regulations, and um, I, this has been difficult to to deal with in the in the model. And for now, we have not uh, found any uh, any correlation between the between the ATFM regulations and the and the selection of the route. Mm -hmm. Have you considered? Uh, there's another question from uh, uh, who asks whether uh, you can create uh, root uh, clusters for free root uh, airspaces. I mean, uh, we are we are using a free root. Uh, I mean, we are using clusters for every OD pair. Uh, that's the same if we are uh, if these uh, flight plans are, uh, are entering in a free root aerospace or not. For us, it's more or less the same. I mean, we are using the the same kind of of ATFM clusters. Indeed, uh, for example, in the um, uh, in the in the picture that I show you in the um, in the in the clustering part, uh, they are probably including some uh, some free route in the in the Italian uh, free route uh, free route airspace. So yeah, that's uh, we are, we are taking it into account. Um, and last question from uh, uh, okay, uh, and last question asking whether uh, you. Uh, can whether the prediction has been affected by the runway configuration or the arrival or the weather model? Uh, yeah. I am not sure if I, if I have understood well the questions. Yes, I mean, uh, it, it is affected. Yeah. How the runway configuration can affect uh, for arrival? Ah. Can Okay. Oh, how how can we, how can I do it? I mean, it it is not very common. Uh, but for example, uh, may I may I present again because uh, this can be uh, sure. um, but, uh, we this have can be seen very. Uh, I I will be quick. I promise. <laughs> uh, this can be uh, uh, shown pretty clear in the years. Okay. So here, for example, um, I mean. Uh, the runway configuration only affects on, on very particular OD pairs, but this is one of them. For example, uh, this is the um, uh, this is the pair, the pair uh, OD pair uh, Rome Amsterdam, and um, in order to to enter in the Netherlands airspace, um, you you have to use uh, um, uh, two different waypoints that are very separated. So in here you you can see that the one is uh, is using the um, the route one, uh, which is entering the the airspace uh, from from Germany, and the other one, the the other ones are are using the a different waypoint that is entering the Netherlands airspace by the um, by, uh, by uh, from Belgium. So in uh, the the stars are in in Amsterdam are are. Are really close to the to the Netherlands, Netherlands airspace border, so you you only have these two options um, for this case. Uh, so uh, in here uh, we can see that uh, these uh, routes are are pretty much uh, similar in in length, but uh, in here um, the the fact that the uh, that the uh, route configurations in in Amsterdam are north. Or, or south, and um, we have seen that it, it's uh, affecting a little bit the, the, the decision. And finally, uh, if uh, everything is, is pretty much similar, uh, you can decide uh, which, which is the, the, the seed, the, the instrumental, uh, I mean, the, the start, the, the instrumental arrival waypoint, uh, which is more convenient for your, uh, for your approach. I, I mean, this is a, 
this is a little bit extreme. It cannot be seen in, in every case, but we have seen that uh, it uh, affects the, the root decision. And that's why we have incorporated. Okay. Thank you very much, Manuel. Thank you very much. Very interesting work. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. You can also see further questions, maybe, and answer in the QA. <coughs> Noah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I so try we, to answer the rest. Yeah. So we can proceed uh, to the next uh, talk by Imen Kif, if I pronounce this well. Uh, okay, Imen is, uh, is a, a research fellow at the sub NTU uh, joint uh, lab. Uh, he has, she has a uh, uh, she, she holds a PhD degree in applied uh, mathematics from the National School of Civil uh, Aviation and ENAC. Uh, and, he has, and she has done work on uh, air traffic management uh, uh, in the Air Traffic Management Research Institute, focusing on uh, proposing data-driven approaches to reducing the terminal maneuvering area congestion. And uh, she continues her research on uh, implementing data-driven metrics for remote tower control centers. So uh, today she presents a tree-based uh, machine learning model for go-around detection and, uh, and prediction. So Iman, thank you very much. Your the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the introduction. So today I'm going to present you a work on a tree-based machine learning model for go-around detection and prediction. During this presentation, so I will go th through this plan. I uh, will present our research background and objective. Then I will introduce the proposed methodology. Uh, I will uh, present our computational results. And then I will conclude with some conclusions and a future work. This research is mainly about go-around. Go around is a maneuver to abandon the approach to landing under unsafe conditions. It may be due to several conditions such as unstable approach and unexpected appearance of hazard on the runway, wind shear, low clouds, or problem of visibility. These procedures are mainly designated to prevent hazardous landing. However, they may generate further safety concerns due to their complex maneuver and time constraints. In fact, the go-around is a safety-critical maneuver because, first of all, it involves last-minute instruction given by the ATC. This instruction may overload the pilot who is already performing crucial action during the go-around, which may lead to critical uh, trajectory deviation. Also, the go-around maneuver increases the cognitive workload on controller, especially when dealing with tightly spaced arrival on the final approach because they will have to ensure clear path for the aircraft that fail the landing, and also to have, uh, they have to reschedule the arrival sequence. The go-around go maneuver itself presents uh, challenges because it will require timely cooperation between the pilot and the controller, which is usually uh, hard to establish because the go-around is uh, usually initiated at very low altitude, sometimes very close to the ground, and also the causes leading to the go-around can be unanticipated and recognized only after the decision height. Also, the digitalization of the airport control tower may bring further uh, challenges in safely conducting the go-around maneuver. And actually here, there is no research so far that have proven this. However, we strongly believe that the digitalization environment brings more opportunities to integrate the new machine learning tools that assist uh, air traffic controller in managing their tasks. Nevertheless, this research is meant to be applied for both uh, conventional and digital control environments. These challenges related to the go-around maneuver provide an opportunity to research and investigate new metrics that help in improving safety of airside uh, airport operations. So in this work, we want to couple the tower or the conventional uh, or the remote control environment with alert system that increase the controller situational awareness for more optimal, efficient, and safe operations. So we mainly uh, propose a data-driven approach to assist the air traffic controller in detecting and uh, in, sorry, in predicting and detecting a go-around. 
Our research question here, here, here is how a go around can be predicted at an early stage in order to help both the controller and the pilot to be prepared to cooperate and to ensure safe and efficient go around maneuver. While researching in this topic, uh, we uh, and exploring the uh, literature work, uh, the previous work, we identify a few research gaps, uh, which I'll be highlighting here, and I divided into four main points. The first one, uh, the specificity of the solution, and actually here all the previous works have proposed a specific solution for a single runway, and by using these uh, the features associated with a a specific runway, the solution may be highly dependent to the application case and may not be may not provide or we're not sure that it will provide uh, results or similar results for airports with multiple runways. And this is particularly important in the case of digital environment, which is operated by multiple runways. The second point is that prediction accuracy. And here, most of the go around prediction model proposed in the literature possess a very low accuracy. And we uh, believe that having low accuracy would result in having many false alerts, which reduces the system trustworthiness and disrupt the ATC, which in turn may lead to increase the uh, workload of the controller. The third point here is the, the data imbalance. And actually this is a common issue when dealing with anomaly prediction, such as the prediction of go around occurrence, because it's a very rare event. And a typical anomaly prediction problem, data imbalance is solved by oversampling or undersampling data sets. However, in this case, these methods cannot address this problem because go around occur during standard phases of the uh, operations. And as a result, go around samples will generally have features closely aligned with non, uh, nominal uh, samples. Uh, this means that nominal and go around samples are very poorly separated in the state space. The last point here is the go around trajectory labeling. Uh, this means uh, how we identify the, the go around trajectory from the flight data. So if we have a flight trajectory, how we can tell that this is a go around trajectory or this is a non go around trajectory. And in previous work, they usually uh, used the altitude increase as uh, or the in the flight profile as the only criteria to identify uh, the go around. And uh, however, the, the flight in the approach phase may increase the altitude to, due to other factors such as, for example, if they want to correct the approach profile or uh, sometimes interrupted by the air traffic controller to increase the altitude. Also, sometimes the go around is initiated close to the missed approach altitude. So the initiation of uh, go around will not uh, automatically uh, be related to an increase or a huge increase in the altitude. So for this reason, the change in altitude should not be the only criteria to recognize a go around and other criteria should be investigated. So in this work, we want to uh, we want to, uh, to to find a solution for all these research gaps, and we we propose a machine learning uh, prediction model for go around events when the aircraft is in uh, its final approach. So the concept diagram of our proposed approach is, sh is shown in the figure over here. Uh, first of all, we have the data that is collected from different sources, like for example, surveillance data, airspace, and meteorological data. And then we implemented a machine learning model. This machine learning model is trained to predict whether the flight is going to perform a go around in its uh, landing, uh, approach phase. So it's a classification model. When the aircraft reaches 10 nautical miles from the runway threshold, the model starts predicting the go around event. And then after that, the prediction is subsequently updated every two nautical miles. The model will end up by uh, either detecting an actual go around or confirming a successful landing. And more specifically, I'm going to illustrate here the four main steps of our algorithm. The first one is data collection. And in this research, we used IDSP flight data extracted from the Open Sky Network 
So we have 10 months of flights arriving and departing from uh, KPHL, uh, which is Philadelphia International Airport. So KPHL is a hub uh, airport in the US and uh, we choose this airport because it's one of the airports that records the highest number of go around in the world. Uh, we, for meteorological data, we use METAR reports from uh, extracted from the KPHL station. Uh, and then the second step of our uh, proposed approach is the go around labeling uh, technique or the go around labeling uh, identification. And the proposed go around uh, uh, identification process here includes few steps. The first step is the flight altitude increase is captured. So if the altitude is increased by more than 300 feet, we may uh, estimate a go around. However, it's not yet sure. So the second step is we check whether the flight is intersecting by, uh, with itself. This is done uh, by uh, iterating the algorithm among all the trajectory segments. And for each iteration, we check the intersection between the active segment, which is shown in red here, and the, uh, the previously, uh, the previous, uh, the preceding trajectory path, which is shown in green. If an intersection is found, then we can tell that a go around is identified. After that, by doing some data exploration, we found out that the go around may occur even when the flight trajectory does not intersect with itself. This is uh, happen when the aircraft changes their landing runway uh, following the go around. And we have an example of the trajectory here in point three. So the aircraft here changes, uh, is intended to land on runway 35, but it perform a go around and then land in 27 right. And in its trajectory, there is not tra uh, the trajectory is not intersecting with itself. So to identify this pattern, we compared the aircraft heading when the altitude increase is initiated with the aircraft heading as the final uh, landing. If those two headings are different, then a go around with runway change is identified. Now this uh, this is uh, works perfectly if the two runways. Uh, have different heading. However, uh, this method does not uh, is not able to determine flights that change the landing runway to an adjacent runway having the same heading. For this, uh, supplementary process is added by checking the number of turning points after initiating the altitude increase. So, uh, after initiating the go around, uh, which is uh, the point uh, labeled in green here we count the number of turning points, which are the red point here. And if the number of turning points is exceeds two, then a go around with runway change is detected. So this is the proposed technique to go around uh, uh, for the go around labeling. And then uh, we move to the feature engineering. And here we prepare all the features that uh, uh, may be involved to or uh, may uh, induce to, uh, may result in a go around. And in uh, here we use a uh, different type of features, for example, the flight information, which includes, for example, the ICAO number or uh, wake turbulence category, uh, call sign, the operator also. Uh, we use also flight parameters such as the positional data, uh, data, yeah, uh, latitude, longitude, altitude, heading, ground speed, and vertical rate. We use flight landing performance, which is uh, the angle, the, the aircraft angle with the runway, trajectory angle with the runway and the glide slope. The energy of the aircraft, we use also airport performance metrics such as departure and arrival, number of departure and arrival within five minutes after go around flight. And uh, finally, we use meteorological data, which include like the wind direction, speed, gas, temperature, visibility, and sky cover. All these features are incorporated in the machine learning model. And here, the prediction model, we implement an extreme, boost, extreme gradient boosting uh, classifier. It's a, a binary classification model. And uh, we also include a, a new uh, method for downsampling. Uh, the, the, this method consists of considering flights that precede or follow a go around instance which is shown in the figure here. So the, the green uh, dot is the go-around flight, 
The red dot is the flight retained in the data after downsampling, and the black dots is the flight removed from the data after the downsampling. So uh, the flight that arrives within uh, an interval uh, of 10 minutes from a go-around flight are retained and uh, are not eligible for downsampling removal. And after that, uh, we randomly choose some flights uh, and include it in the uh, data as a flight uh, set in order to avoid the overfitting of the model. So here is our proposed methodology, and now I'm going to move to the computational results, and I'll start with the go-around trajectory labeling. Uh, uh, so the go-around trajectory labeling results in 731 go-arounds, including 93 flights that change their runway after the go-around. And the, uh, and the box, uh, the histogram here in the uh, right-hand side shows the distance between the go-round initiation point and the runway threshold. And in this work, we only consider the go-rounds that are initiated within uh, 10 nautical miles from the runway threshold, which consists of a number of 662 go-rounds. Uh, this number of go-rounds represents 0.5% of the total number of arrivals. That's why the data we have is very is highly imbalanced data, and we use the down, uh, the down sampling technique for that. For the machine learning model, we, uh, for the data partition, we use 80% of the uh, data to the training data set, and, <clears throat> sorry, and 20% uh, uh, test data set. And we, we use three-fold cross-validation to determine the optimal parameter for each uh, prediction model. And the table on the uh, right-hand side here shows the uh, data demography for the full data set and the downsampling data set every uh, for every radius so from 10 nautical miles to two nautical miles uh, i'm going now to present you the prediction results and uh, the results using the full data set are in the histogram in the left hand side and the results for the downsampling technique are highlighted in the right hand side so different color here shows the prediction results at different radius from the runway threshold. Uh, the algorithm performance, as you can see here, it increases as the aircraft approach uh, the landing and the best results are recorded at two nautical miles. Uh, here, for example, for the full data set, uh, the accuracy of the algorithm is 0 0.99. However, the high accuracy here results uh, can be achieved by only predicting the majority class. So it cannot be used to assess the model performance. And uh, we rather use the precision and recall. And with the full data set, we can see here the recall at two nautical mile is 0 0.33, uh, which means that 33% of the go rounds are detected. The precision here is 0 0.75, which means that 75% of the system alerts are correct. Now for the downsampling technique, at two nautical mile, we have half of the go-around are detected, which is shown here uh, with the re uh, recall result. Uh, at two nautical mile is equal to 0 0.56. And uh, the precision is 0 0.9, which means that 90% of the system go-around alerts are actual go-arounds. So here the system places higher priority to predicting a correct go around, which is high precision than a detecting a go around, which is the recall. Uh, okay, so um, to conclude here, we propose a go, uh, go around prediction uh, model. Uh, for the efficiency, the model is able to detect half of the flight go around with an accuracy of 90% of correct go-around system alerts. The model is applicable for a complete runway system. We use the go-around uh, uh, flights recorded for all the um, uh, runways in KPHL airport. And uh, the prediction is able, uh, updated every two nautical miles. As future work, or let's say things to be improved in this model, uh, here we, we actually uh, get a result that outperform uh, previous works in uh, especially uh, at the radius two nautical mile from the airport. 
However, uh, the accuracy uh, for uh, uh, farther radios is, uh, is low, and the failure in uh, accurately predicting the go around can be justified through three main uh, factors. The first one is the decision to go around usually due to can be due to several factors that are hard or sometimes impossible to measure, uh, such as pilot experience, personality, or level of fatigue. Also, the visibility here, which is very important criteria for a go around, uh, is provided by the meter. And this uh, uh, measurement is not accurate and does not really provide the actual visibility level at the decision height. Uh, another point here is our model lacks the airport surface movement, uh, which we believe is a very important factor that affects the go around decision. So as a future work, we plan to, instead of predicting uh, or instead of uh, implementing a, a classification model, binary classification model, we rather predict the safety level of an approach. Uh, and uh, this will link this will link with the go-around likelihood or the probability of a go-around. Uh, so here we believe that if we predict the likelihood of a go-around will reduce the impact of the pilot subjectivity on the prediction. And also this will alleviate a little bit the data imbalance problem. So uh, that ends my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Evan. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, in the question and answers list. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, concerning imbalance, the uh, data set uh, asked by Lucas uh, Beller, has, this question has been answered. Uh, if you want to follow up, uh, Lucas, please uh, go ahead. But there's a, a, a question concerning that uh, also uh, saying that. Uh, what uh, uh, what uh, uh, is the effect uh, of uh, uh, considering a specific uh, uh, percentage, let's say, of uh, of uh, go arounds among the total number of uh, flights uh, in your model? I mean, uh, when this prior changes, uh, can your model still uh, apply? When the airport change. No, when the prior, uh, I mean, the uh, okay, you do some kind of uh, down sampling. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, almost for the go around uh, are uh, are um, uh, are much uh, higher in percentage than uh, mm -hmm. are. So, uh, what is this uh, number? I mean, uh, is it? Uh, uh, fifty percent from your samples, or what? Uh, uh, no, uh, no. After the downsampling technique, the the number of go around is uh, actually it, it's around ten percent of the. Uh, well, of the if this ten yeah. percent changes, I mean, if you apply that in another airport, so whether this uh, this uh, prior of ten percent changes, is your model still uh, applicable there? Uh, Okay, uh, honestly, I think if we apply it to another airport, I think the problem is not on the data. However, it's uh, the problem is that each airport has different procedure for a go around. So uh, I think, or yeah, I, I believe the model, uh, it's difficult to implement a same model for many airports uh, to predict the go around. It should be specific for each airport. That's that's actually my belief because uh, it depends on the go-around procedure, and uh, I, I I don't I mean I haven't tried my model for another airport, but I don't think uh, it could work for different airports. Mm -hmm. So what are yeah. the important features there? For the Sorry. Airport? What are the important features for the airport? Uh, yeah, it's the, it depends on the airport elevation, the runway elevation, it depends on the procedure, uh, what, what is the decision altitude, the go around decision altitude, what is the procedure of the go around, whether, uh, how, how the go around is performed in that airport, I, uh, I believe uh, this is very specific to each runway, so uh, 
the model can be updated to be uh, to to retrain again with another airport. However, the same model of uh, KPHL, I don't believe it can work for other airports. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, another question uh, from uh, Emre is, uh, how can you eliminate touch and go or low pass operations with your go around uh, prediction algorithm? And also this is all much related uh, to, the, uh, to the accuracy of the uh, ADSB data and uh, the coverage of the ADSB data uh, in low altitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's actually, yeah, that's a good point because uh, with ADSB data, we don't have the lending uh, of the, 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 the lending of the aircraft because usually the ADSB is disconnected just before the landing, that, just before the touchdown. So we don't have the trajectory uh, after the touchdown or at the touchdown. Uh, the trajectory I've got, I think it's usually around uh, 100 feet, 50 feet maximum before the touchdown. So we don't have the complete trajectory and this is a missing point in our uh, work. That's correct, yeah. So, uh, okay, we have, we have a couple minutes more. So, uh, uh, questions, uh, whether you have investigated the main reasons for the detected go rounds, for instance, uh, uh, wind hmm. and so on. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think this is very hard to capture from the data, from the historical data. I, I, I even believe, I think it's even impossible because the go round, the causes of the go round is usually uh, very linked to the pilot's behavior and how the pilot see the situation at the moment uh, when he decided to, to go around. So uh, yeah, honestly, with the ADSB data, only the trajectory data, it's very difficult to tell whether the causes of the go around, because sometimes in the same condition, in the same uh, weather condition, visibility, and trajectory profile, we can find one uh, trajectory that performed the go around and another one that the, the continues the landing. And this means that it, it depends on the pilot decision at that moment. And that's why I also mentioned about the visibility. Uh, the, the go around is initiate, usually initiated at the decision height, uh, the decision altitude, and it depends whether the pilot could see the runway or not. The visibility uh, measurement we have from the METAR cannot really tell exactly how the uh, the pilot uh, is, um, I mean, how is the visibility exactly at the decision height? Uh, sometimes, okay, there is cloud, but maybe the cloud, it's not uh, exactly in front of the runway or sometimes in the same configuration, uh, uh, it, it, the, the runway could be uh, seen or not. So I think uh, only from ADSB data, it's almost uh, impossible to, identify what was the causes of the go round. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Since you, you, you're, you're employing a, a decision tree, uh, have, or, I mean, uh, have you done any, or do you plan to do any kind of analysis in order to investigate the most important features for your model in order to, 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 to explain Quite, this? Yeah. Yeah, actually, this work uh, was followed by, by another research uh, at, uh, I, uh, uh, conducted on the go round probability prediction, the likelihood of a go round probability, which will be uh, published soon. And in that work, we investigated the causes of the go round, the main feature of the go round. Uh, yeah, we have more, uh, we have data that has more uh, parameters, let's say. Yeah, it's, we, we, do, we do not use the ADSB data we have more rich uh, data set to uh, investigate. Okay, thank you very much, Moon. very interesting uh, work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, thank you. So we proceed to the next uh, presentation of this uh, session. Uh, the last one of the session uh, from uh, Wixiang Lim, Wix Lim who is a research fellow uh, at the sub-NTU joint lab also. 
Uh, he focuses on data-driven algorithms for airport uh, surface movement prediction and optimization. He has uh, obtained a PhD in aerospace engineering from RMIT uh, University in Melbourne, um, uh, where he did the research on human machine uh, systems for multi-agent uh, UAS operations. And he has a, a background in human factors engineering, modeling, and simulation at, uh, optimal control. Uh, he is uh, working now in uh, machine learning for ADCO decision support uh, tools in remote uh, towers, and uh, his uh, uh, paper is very much related to that uh, and uh, concerns vari variable taxi out time prediction using graph uh, neural networks. So, Wicks, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, George, for the introduction. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm here to present some of the work that we've been doing at the sub-NTU Joint Lab on variable taxi out time prediction using graph neural networks. So my name is Yi Xiang, uh, and I also like to acknowledge my co-authors, Feng Ji, Nimrod, and Samir, who have contributed significantly to this project. So for this presentation, I will go a bit into the research context and objectives, our motivation for doing the research, our proposed approach, and then uh, I'll be giving some of some of the definitions before we go a bit technical into the methodology. And finally, I will present my results and uh, give some conclusions and present our future work. So we align our research with the objectives of uh, ACDM or Airport Collaborative Decision Making. ACDM is a concept of operations where different stakeholders share information and collaborate on decision making at the airport. The objective is to increase the efficiency and adaptability of aerodrome operations through timely, accurate, and transparent information. Many airports around the world have been laying the foundations of ACDM, and in recent years, we are starting to see the initial benefits of some of the airports that have been leading the way. The figure here shows the key elements for the implementation of ACDM as provided by Eurocontrol. ACDM brings a number of changes to the current mode of operations, which in turn presents several opportunities for research. Firstly, Increased digitalization from information sharing will support the implementation of data-driven approaches, which could improve the predictability and accuracy of information. At the same time, the ACDM environment will be inherently more complex and dynamic than traditional procedural-based procedural operations. There are opportunities to help develop decision support tools to help air traffic controllers or ADCOs perform dynamic replanning in collaboration with different stakeholders in order to maximize the benefits from ACDM. Our research focuses on elements two and three, uh, variable taxi time prediction and pre-departure planning. And these are the prerequisite building blocks for the latter ACDM elements and also tightly interconnected with each other. Formally for our project, the research objectives are as follows. We would like to develop data-driven algorithms for aerodrome operations, uh, focusing on departures, specifically addressing the pre-departure planning horizon of 30 minutes prior to the off-lock time or the OBT. This is considered the short-term planning horizon, according to the ACDM manual, as the target setup time, the TSET, is typically issued 30 to 40 minutes prior to TOBT, the target off block time. The project can be broken down into two components, prediction and optimization. For the prediction component, we would like to predict the impeded or the variable taxi out time. For ease of operational implementation, we impose requirements that the input data is based on readily available information for example, the off-lock time, the taxi route, the queue position, etc. These are information that uh, can be obtained from service management systems, for example. It is also known that delays are primarily caused by congestion in the taxi network. Hence, our model would incorporate the flow characteristics of aircraft movements. Finally, we impose a, a performance requirement of plus minus two minutes for 90% of all departures. This is also based on the ACDM manual. Uh, yes, the, uh, the manual specifies a desired accuracy of plus minus two, minute, two minutes in the short-term prediction horizon, 30 minutes before the off-block time. Uh, the optimization component is still ongoing work and is not part of this presentation. To address the prediction problem, we propose modeling the surface flow at an intermediate mesoscopic level. This is opposed to microscopic models, which model the individual movement of aircraft and macroscopic models, which contain high-level aggregated airport features. A mesoscopic model allows us to incorporate spatial and topological information of the airport taxi network in our model, while simplifying the context, complex interactions between aircraft. 
temporal information is modeled uh, by flow metrics using a graph-based approach with information contained in the graph's dynamic edge attributes, uh, as you can see in the, in the figure. The flow information is shared across all movements when predicting the, the individual taxi out times. We also leverage a set of tools called graph neural networks or GNN to perform deep learning on graphs. In addition to flow metrics, uh, which are edge attributes on the graph, we also include attributes related to the taxi route, as well as aircraft carrier and weather specific information in our model. Let's lay down some basic, basic definitions before going into the details of our methodology. For a departing aircraft, we are interested in the taxi out time, which is the time it takes to travel from the gate to the runway. Formally, we define the variable or impeded taxi out time as the total duration when the aircraft goes off block and when it enters the runway. The, un the impeded time is made up of two components, the unimpeded and the additional taxi, taxi time. The unimpeded time uh, does not account for surface traffic, i.e. no slowing down or stopping due to other aircraft. Generally, the impeded time is harder to predict, especially at complex airports, but this is what is useful for planning and uh, sequencing purposes in actual operations. We also introduced some definitions for graphs and graph neural networks. So what is a graph? A graph is a set of nodes uh, or vertices and edges or links. If an edge exists between two nodes, then uh, the two nodes are related. Graphs can also be either directed or undirected. If they are directed, then the edges describe a relationship between a source node and a target node. Uh, GNNs are a way of performing deep learning on non-Euclidean structured data. So this is Euclidean structured data and this is non-Euclidean structured data. Uh, conventional deep learning methods such as CNNs, which operate on Euclidean structured data, cannot be directly applied to this sort of data. So research in the past decade or so has come up with a collection of tools for this purpose. Uh, the operations performed by GNNs, such as convolution and pooling, are in many ways similar to those of CNNs, if uh, you're familiar with uh, CNNs. So with these definitions in place, let's dive into our methodology. The general idea is to capture flow and route information in a graph and to use this graph along with other features to predict the impeded taxi out time, which is a graph level task. Our methodology comprises three stages, pre-processing of raw data in gray, uh, graph fusion in blue, and model training and validation in green. To begin with, we were given surface movement data recorded by the sub aeroban system by uh, sub in the, in the US. Uh, this, this data comprised raw unsorted track positions and flight plan data, among other things. Uh, these were processed to obtain the four-dimensional trajectory, uh, as well as flight plan related data. The Araban data also contain weather data, such as TEF and META, which we extracted as auxiliary data. We then fused the trajectory data with a graph of the airport using a map matching algorithm, enriching our trajectory with spatial and contextual information. We also perform some additional processing to enrich the trajectory with movement status and runway queuing information. With the enriched data, we could obtain the reverse engineered taxi route or taxi intent, and we could also accurately pinpoint the actual off block, takeoff, landing, and in block times. These were more accurate and reliable than the milestone timings provided in the Araban system. The taxi route and trajectory start times were then used to derive flow estimates, uh, while the actual flow, uh, flow was obtained by pro processing the actual trajectory data. The actual flow data was used to disaggregate the taxi out times into different components. For example, time spent in the runway queue, uh, time spent at runway crossing, time spent in, uh, in taxiways with low flow, etc. The, the higher granularity of this breakdown helps in outlier identification during model training. Uh, the impeded and unimpeded taxi times were used as target outputs when training our model. So the third stage contains, contains processes for data set preparation and model training and validation. Each departure trajectory is represented as a subset graph of the airport taxi network. This graph is obtained by pruning away irrelevant parts of the original network in the graph pruning uh, box. We combine this with some auxiliary data, uh, for example, weather, week category, and aircraft data, and subsequently perform the model training and validation. For benchmarking, we compare the model performance with the FAA's Aviation Policy and Planning Office APO model and Eurocontrol's Performance Review Unit PRU models. So these are standard models. Our data pipeline covers quite a lot of ground, okay, from the raw data processing all the way up to model training. However, in the interest of time, I will only cover the more salient aspects of our methodology, primarily those pertaining to the GNN framework. 
Looking at the GNN, we are interested in a graph level prediction task, specifically predicting the in, uh, impeded or unimpeded time from a graph. In this image, we have a trajectory represented here as a graph. This could represent a departure where an aircraft taxis out from a gate to its assigned runway before taking off. The taxi route is highlighted in red and the other surrounding taxiways are shown in black. This trajectory graph is a subset of the original airport graph containing only the parts that could impede or impact our aircraft's movement. Uh, for our JNN model, we have three types of attributes, node attributes, edge attributes, and global attributes. Node and edge attributes are part of the graph, while global attributes refer to features that cannot be represented in graph format. So uh, we will leave out the details on what each type of attribute represent, uh, but they are all in the table here and also in the paper. Graph pruning is performed to reduce the size of the graph, uh, which reduces memory requirements and computational costs during model training. Intuitively, flow conditions that are distant from the taxi route have insignificant impact on the taxi time. This contributes to noise when performing the GNN operations. For each trajectory, we define as anchor nodes the set of nodes in a taxi route. We then conduct two stages of pruning, a distance-based pruning, where we only retain nodes that are within a certain distance from the anchor nodes, and a flow-based pruning where we only retain edges that contain non-zero flow features. Uh, the, the remaining uh, edges and nodes are removed. The results of pruning are shown in this figure, and the table shows the graph size after, pr after pruning based on a distance threshold D. And you can see that if we set D to 500 meters, we obtain about an order of magnitude uh, uh, reduction of the graph size on average. So I'll pass quickly over the GNN architecture, but the key points are that uh, it comprises a spatial block nested within a temporal block. So the spatial block uh, processes the spatial information, whereas the temporal block processes the dynamic uh, information. GNN operations, convolution and pooling, are contained in the spatial block, and the other blocks are mainly concatenation and dense layers. In addition to the GNN model, we also include a GBM, or gradient boosted machine model for comparison. GBMs belong to the family of decision tree based methods such as random forest, and they're considered to be conventional machine learning as opposed to deep learning. We also use the, uh, we use the global feature set uh, that is shown in the previous slide to train the GBM model. And besides the GNN and GBM models, we also include the following as benchmarks, a naive estimate where we use the mean time for the training data set to predict on the test set, as well as the PRU and APO methods. Uh, and the disclaimer is that the, these two methods are meant to provide high level metrics for airport performance monitoring and review, and therefore serve a different purposes than our intended application, which is a real time decision support tool. Uh, however, these are still useful benchmarks, uh, as you can see later. So our case study focuses on Atlanta airport. It's quite a large hub airport with five runways, all in east to west configuration. And there are two runways north of the terminals and three runways south. Our data set comprises 62 days of data, uh, over the two months of December 2019 and January 2020. Altogether, there were about 136,000 movements in total, or 2.2 thousand combined movements a day, which is quite a, considered quite a busy airport. Arrivals were only used to generate flow estimates, while departures were used both to generate flow estimates and to train our model. The, the taxi out time distribution is shown here, and it follows a fairly log normal distribution, a skewed normal distribution. And this is before the outlier removal. After our layer removal, we, we retain about 91% of data. So to compare our model, we use three performance metrics, uh, the root mean square error or RMSE, the mean average error or MAE, and the mean average percentage error or MAPE. So the RMSE and MAE are similar metrics. They both reflect, reflect the absolute error, but the RMSE tends to penalize our layers more due to the square in the term. The MAPE is a measure of relative error with respect to the target value. Uh, we also train two models, one for predicting the impeded and one for predicting the unimpeded taxi time because the literature, uh, they are both uh, times being presented in the literature also. Uh, as, as, as expected, the machine learning methods outperform the standard benchmarks. So the machine learning methods uh, are GBM and GNN in purple and green. Uh, across the board, the naive method, the blue, the one in blue performs the worst, the worst with an MAE of around three minutes. Uh, the GNN and GBM models are on par with each other, with the GNN and GBM uh, GNN model outperforming the GBM by one to two seconds. Although this is a small improvement, we can see that the GNN outperforms the, GN the GBM uh, consistently across the board. 
uh, so, so some additional results on the error distribution in box plot format. So the boxes contain the 25th to 75th percentile of data, also known as the interquartile range or IQR. And the whiskers denote uh, 1.5 times the IQR or 2.7 sigma, 99.3% if we assume a normal distribution. Uh, the data points outside these whiskers are considered outliers. The dotted lines here uh, denote the plus minus 120 seconds range. Uh, and both GBM and GNN models satisfy our initial research objective of plus minus two minutes for 90% of all departures. As can be seen in the table, the GNN is slightly more accurate than the GBM, with about 1% more predictions than the GBM falling within each error range. In terms of model complexity, the relative simplicity of the GBM gives it an advantage in terms of model implementation and int integration, since the performance of both models is comparable. However, we note that the GNN performance is a pretty good achievement, given that this is the first iteration in our model, whereas the GBM is a, uh, really a fairly mature technique. We expect to improve the GNN's performance in future iterations. Additionally, the greater flexibility of the GNN also gives it an advantage over the GBM, as it's not, not just able to perform graph level tasks, it's also able to perform node level and edge level inference tasks. So examples are predicting hotspots and nodes or taxi speeds at, at edges. We have only scratched the surface uh, of the GNN uh, with this graph level task, this repeated time prediction. So finally, I will conclude. Uh, results show that the machine le learning methods provide greater prediction accuracy com compared to the standard methods. Uh, the GNN performance was slightly better than the GBM one. Uh, the GNN framework also offers greater fe flexibility than the GBM in terms of the type of prediction task. For ease of integration into surface management systems, the data requirements for our model was constrained to what was assumed to be operationally available, primarily the off-lock time and the root information. Our model incorporated topological and spatial features using a graph of the airport taxi network and temporal features by mapping flow information onto the graph. We believe that the flow features improve the robustness of the GNN model compared to the GBM one, but this will need further investigation. The graph pruning technique was also an important process, which reduced the irrelevant information and improved computational efficiency. It helped to speed up the training process quite significantly. On the test data set, the 90th percentile of absolute error was about 120 seconds for both machine learning models. This met our initial research objective. Finally, some extensions to our work. We want to see how generalizable the model is to different airports. Our case study, Atlanta, is quite a large and busy airport, uh, but the movement the movements are not so complex since the arrivals and departures tend to be independently handled by different run runways. So it would be interesting to see how the model performs at smaller airports or airports using mixed mode runways. We will also be extending the model to pre predict the arrival taxi in time. Uh, we use about two months of data, about 60,000 trajectories, but we would like to know if more data can improve the model performance. We are also looking at improving the model performance through feature engineering uh, and modifying the model architecture. Finally, a little more long-term, we would like to look at integrating the prediction model into an optimization framework and also investigate its utility as an ethical decision support tool. Thank you so much for your time and attention and feel free to contact me at my email or on Whova if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh... So, uh, yeah, there is a question on special weather conditions. <laughs> whether you weather conditions? Include the, the icing, for instance. Uh, um, so we, uh, we, did, we did include uh, weather data uh, in the auxiliary data. We took the meta and the TAF data, uh, but we found that uh, it was not accurate enough. So it was like 90% of the time, the, it was the same weather condition. Uh, and for Atlanta, like for the data set that we looked at uh, December, there were some trajectories that went through the icing. Uh, yeah, the, the, they went through the icing pad, um, but I think it, it will not affect uh, the model itself because um, the route is already uh, already incorporates the icing uh, path. Mm -hmm. But that's a good question. So the, they'll be holding at the icing pad, but I think we will assume that the model will, will account for this uh, when when they uh, when it does the when it does the when we train it with the data. Okay, uh, so uh, I do not see uh, any other question here, but uh, I have a question on uh, on um, uh, on the features that you use for for traffic. Uh, so how do you measure traffic? Uh, and, uh, so right. Okay, I will go to my backup slides. Okay, so there are two steps. Uh, 
the first step is uh, when we estimate the trajectory, when we provide a uh, four-dimensional estimate of the trajectory. Uh, and the second step is when we derive flow estimates from, from this four-dimensional trajectory estimate. So um, the reason is that we cannot uh, use the actual data when we when we get the flow data because this data is not available operationally. So we have to estimate the, the trajectory. Uh, we have to make an estimate of what the path of the, of the, the aircraft will take, uh, at what time it will arrive at certain points in its in its route. And then uh, from from the trajectory estimate, we get some flow estimates from there. Uh, so we make some assumptions uh, on on the when we make the four-dimensional trajectory estimate. But in essence, we are taking uh, an estimate of a very uh, uh, very basic estimate of the unimpeded taxi time. Okay, and then we uh, we hope that the, the machine learning model will will compensate for any discrepancies. So with this uh with this uh Estimate of the of the uh, four, dimension, four dimensional trajectory estimate. You basically get a time at each node, okay, uh, and then you can we we get we derive three dynamic features, the edge features essentially. So uh, the aircraft count, the flow probability, and the flow potential. So the aircraft count basically is saying that if uh, so for this edge, uh, uh, tau i to tau j, okay, if uh, yeah. if it passes. Yeah, sorry. We do not see your slides if you share something you want to share. Uh, you don't see my slides? No. I don't see them. Should I should I share them again or yes, please? Okay, I will share my slides again then. Uh, okay. Okay. Can you see them? Yes, yes thank you. Okay, so uh so so we have a four-dimensional trajectory, an estimate uh, of the unim unimpeded trajectory, uh, which essentially is a time uh, at each node. Okay, uh, so uh, we get three flow metrics: aircraft count, flow probability, flow potential. So the aircraft count is basically saying that if uh, if the uh, if the time intersects with this sliding window, then add one to the count. Okay, uh, the flow probability and flow potential they look at an offset. Uh, which is uh, an offset between tau ij and um, the midpoint of your sliding window, uh, and then uh, so this is this is basically the offset. Okay, and then if the offset is zero, then you get a high value. If the offset uh, is very far, is very large, then basically you're you're not expected to be at this point uh, during this sliding window. Uh, the the probability is the maximum of of this sigma of this uh, of this of all the trajectories within the window, and the potential is the sum of all the of all the uh, sigmas of all the trajectories. So yeah, it's uh, uh, we still need to validate the the, the features. So we have we, in in the methodology there are uh, actual flow and estimated flow. Okay, but we didn't uh, actually validate the the two. So we need to make sure that the estimated flow is uh, similar to the actual flow. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's the flow features. Okay, thank you. So th there's another question on uh, what's the value of using of comparing with a deterministic model. Uh, for calculating this uh, the, the taxi time uh, yeah okay um, so yeah sorry mm -hmm. so by deterministic model you mean like for example the naive the pru and the apo methods um, so these met these uh, models they probably cannot really account for the surface traffic uh, so uh, because surface traffic changes uh, very dynamically uh, and and you cannot account for all the all the possible cases of of uh, of uh, traffic uh, for all departures. So usually, if you have a deterministic model that accounts for surface traffic, is is a macroscopic model. So they look at very high level metrics. Um, but the the GNN approach, uh, you can model the the flow at edge at the at the airport's edges, the taxiways. So you can get quite accurate. Uh, uh, you can get quite accurate results. So the, the advantages are basically uh, more accurate results. Yeah. Uh, so the other approach is a microscopic model. For example, if you do, if you simulate the aircraft trajectory, uh, simulate all the all the traffic uh, that that is uh, going on and how it affects the aircraft, and you need to. But this 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 is a microscopic approach, uh, for for one is quite computationally expensive, and for another you need to handcraft the rules or you need to learn the rules, which is another machine learning problem in itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh... The final question in the sense uh, uh, whether uh, the uh, 
minus plus two minutes of accuracy applicable, whether this, uh, this accuracy is applicable to for all the stands and uh, runways, uh, how, uh, how this can vary between different uh, stand locations, for instance. Yeah. Okay, so the question was about uh, how the, the difference in the, the origin destination affects the accuracy. Um, and that's a good question because we didn't look into that. Uh, we, we got the we got accuracy uh, just uh, on the bulk of data. So yeah, I guess in, in, in future work we should investigate um, which trajectories are being uh, are being uh, being on the outliers of the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but this uh, this uh, this this ninety percent of uh, plus minus one hundred twenty minutes is on all the departures. Uh, within the two months, so about 62,000 trajectories, oh, sorry, 10% of the 62,000 trajectories because we only do, do it on the test set. So 6,000 trajectories, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I see. Okay, uh, so yes, thank you very much. There's no okay. other question uh, here. Okay. So we close this uh, session. Thank you all for participating and for your very uh, interesting questions and of course for the very uh, interesting and challenging presentations. Thank you very much all. So thank you. Okay, let's go to the other sessions and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the sits. Thank you very much. ISOBAR project is present at the Cesar Innovation Days for its second year, and since last year, a lot of things have happened. As a recap, ISOBAR is... Um, not see the screen, uh, maybe... Uh, okay, now. If we provide air traffic controllers with artificial intelligence to automate some of their tasks, they could potentially increase their work capacity and handle more flights. To reach this vision, there are challenges on the way. We have to take many aspects into consideration, like explainability of AI, human-machine interaction, safety aspects, infinite traffic scenarios to potentially train on, weather conditions, financial costs, and redundancy. To address these challenges, we have partnered in this project with the IBM Garage and IBM Research. We named our solution Advanced Auto Planner. The Advanced Auto Planner AI model is designed to use a safety-first approach and operates in two phases. Phase 1 forecasts the future state of the airspace to determine safe actions that avoid future conflicts. And Phase 2 provides best course of action based on ranking safe actions from understanding common aircraft characteristics. ISOBAR project is present at the Cesar Innovation Days for its second year, and since last year, a lot of things have happened. As a recap, ISOBAR is improving the way air traffic flow and capacity management deals with weather occurrences, with five artificial intelligence components that can help making a difference in probabilistic weather forecast, estimation of airspace capacity decay, detection of hotspots, preferences of airspace users for routines, and production of mitigations for demand and capacity imbalances. All these artificial intelligence components have been developed over the last year and a half. Some of them are already validated. This poster includes some snapshots of the communication prototype displaying the innovative features of ISOBAR integrated solution. You are invited to visit ISOBAR website to interact with this communication prototype. To take the tour by the hand of a network manager controller, check out ISOBAR video, where our colleague from Eurocontrol, Stefan Pierre, provides a panoramic view of the ISOBAR prototype.